thanks for coming tonight. Um, this is our first uh, talk back after the uh, summer uh, recess. Um, prior to um, August, we delivered somewhere in the region of about 30 talks uh, on uh, around the retrofit uh, exhibition uh, and program that we've had running since uh, mid-May. Um, for those of you who are attending first time um, and not seen the exhibition, uh, please do take the opportunity to uh, go upstairs and have a look around, maybe come back on another day with, with your teams. Uh, we've actually extended the exhibition through to mid-October uh, now, uh, really due to demand. We've had a great footfall um, off the back of the exhibition. Uh, and the actual programme of talks and events has extended as well. Uh, so we'll be running extra talks. All the talks programmes can be seen on uh, the website, uh, buildingcentre.co.uk. Um, so all forthcoming programmes. We're running two events per week. Uh, one is a webinar. Uh, it happens on a Tuesday lunchtime. Uh, and an in-person event such as tonight, which happens on Wednesday evening. So do take a look at the website. Uh, likewise, um, we've delivered, as I've mentioned, over 20 talks so far. They are all recorded uh, and they're all sitting on our website, so do take the, uh, the opportunity to have a look at those. And they cover a wide range of subjects um, around the retrofit uh, uh, equation. Um, so we've looked at the use of natural materials, uh, how we treat historic buildings, uh, solid walled housing, uh, um, overheating, uh, estates uh, and social housing, just to name but a few. So do please take the opportunity to ha have a look at the website when you get a chance. Um, we have throughout this program tried to look at the challenges that are faced with retrofitting and retrofitting at scale. Um, but we also want to really showcase the benefits that can be derived. Um, and perhaps one of the most important aspects of retrofitting um, and I guess the one that individuals can perhaps associate most with is well-being um, in terms of both the physical uh, and mental uh, benefits of improving and upgrading uh, your properties. I think the, the subject of well-being can't be underestimated. Um, there are huge economic and social benefits associated uh, with the retrofitting of, of properties um, and they're huge um, if you know if you look at the NHS they spend 1.4 billion pounds per year treating people living in cold damp housing with respiratory conditions uh, uh, and other uh, medical uh, conditions so that's a huge sum of money you know that could be saved it could be diverted to other causes it could be put into retrofitting to help people achieve the upgrades to their properties. So it's a very important subject and one that mustn't be overlooked. Um, I'm pleased to say we've an, got an absolute stellar cast of speakers tonight um, who will be sharing both their wisdom and knowledge on, on this subject area. Um, this, that's all from me, other than say, please make sure your phones are on silent and we've got no planned fire drills tonight, so should there be an alarm, Please leave the room the way you came in and the staff will direct you out of the building. I'm going to hand you over to Tim Crawshaw. Um, he will be uh, a sort of chair and, and uh, in charge of proceedings this evening. Um, Tim's knowledge in this area is second to none. Um, he's recently stepped down as the president of the uh, Royal Town Planning Institute. He's a practitioner, uh, an educator who specialises in urban design, uh, master planning uh, and sustainable development. Uh, and I actually have to say a special thanks to Tim. Um, simply the fact, Tim and I probably spoke about this subject two years ago, and he really started me on this road about the building centre putting on this programme of uh, retrofit events and talks. And this is very much a starting point for us. The so Retrofit 23 has been looking at residential uh, uh, retrofitting. Next year, we will be looking at commercial retrofitting, commercial, cultural and civic buildings. So. Tim is passionate about this, uh, and I think one of the other things I'd like to sort of stress about the whole subject of retrofitting for us is actually it's about regeneration of areas. Uh, and that's certainly where Tim's come from with sort of his planning and urban development knowledge. Um, and particularly with bylaw housing, which is, you know, deprived areas throughout the country. 
uh, that don't have the knowledge or the capital to undertake those projects and how we can sort of retrofit at neighbourhood level. Um, so I'm going to pass you now over to Tim, uh, and thanks very much for coming again. Thank you very much, John. Um, right, OK, well, I'm, I'm Tim Crosh, or John's introduced me, uh, immediate past president of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Um, my background's architecture first, then urban design, and then into town planning. Uh, but my interest in town planning is mainly around the social aspects. He's actually been a social scientist. Some people characterise um, climate change, for example, as being a technical thing that's got a social element to it. And actually, I like to turn that on its head. And actually, climate change is a social thing with a technical element to it. And I think retrofitting is very much that. If you're dealing with people's homes, you know, much of the symbolic value of a house or a home is so deeply embedded in our consciousness that everything that we do, every move that we make, is giving people that future springboard. So we're not just investing in homes, we're investing in people, and we're also investing to save money downstream. As John's alluded to, we spend a lot of money fixing people when they're broke. And actually, housing is one of the main things we can do right now to improve health and well-being. So I'm not even going to talk about something advanced. I used to work for a thing called Healthy New Towns, which was NHS for about 2016 to 2019. Built environment was the bit I was covering. Uh, and the town I was working in was Darlington, which if you've ever been up to Edinburgh on the train, you'll go past Darlington. Whew, gone. There we are. Stop. It's actually quite nice. It's where they invented trains, ironically, when you go shooting past. But, broadly speaking, there was a bit of research done by Teesside University, and this always makes, gives me a shiver. If we'd spent, well, basically, if we invested in grab handles and mending the steps, the front step, that's all, of somebody's home that's vulnerable to a fall, it will pay for itself. Guess how long it will pay for itself in? Just pull back. Three months. So the actual admission costs of people having falls when they're vulnerable is you could pay for it in three months just by investing right now and not have to do it again. Imagine all that human misery you would actually get rid of on the way as everything else. So that's just a simple example. So it's not just about the, the stuff we normally talk about, which is energy efficiency. And when I was studying, you know, architecture years back, our major consideration was fuel poverty. You know, to be fair, if you were thinking about sustainability, the next layer down was, how are we going to keep people warm in winter? Well, you know, that is still a challenge. But how are we going to keep people cool in summer? I currently work in Surrey, and what you can see is the rich are starting to retrofit their houses with big white air conditioning units. And you can tell the ones that can afford it, it goes with a swimming pool, you know. And it doesn't even put the heat that you extract or whatever into the swimming pool either. So we're not even doing a closed loop there. But broadly speaking, the opportunities that we've got now is to actually think about this at a strategic level. John's alluded to my passion. And the reason why I haven't got a diagram up there is because I fundamentally believe this needs to be the work of many hands. We have around seven and a half million bylaw houses out there in the UK. Brilliant. You know, the real big good thing about bylaw houses is they're all more or less the same. Everybody goes, oh, it's that two up, two down, isn't it? You know, it's probably got solid wall construction. It's probably got a back lane that's only used for getting rid of the rubbish these days. Nobody has a coal hole anymore, you know. Could we not reimagine this housing, which has now become an investment vehicle for some people, as being the housing of first choice? Because actually, you've got electric vehicle charging. Actually, you've got sustainable drainage. Actually, you've got a nice street the kids can play in. Actually, you might have a garden. Actually, you might have mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, etc. It doesn't cost very much that. And actually, MVHR has been proven to improve people's asthma scores by a couple of points. It's really obvious things we could do. A whole package, and this is where, if we all work together and bring the social, the financial, and the technical together, we might start to solve some of these problems, because it won't happen overnight, it will not be easy, and to quote a president, we don't do this because it's easy, we do it because it's hard, you know? 
doing this particular thing will probably change the lives of about 20 million people conservatively. That's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? And we're not talking about masses and masses of investment, but think of all the other things that go with that, the supply chain opportunities, the regeneration opportunities, the employment that could be created, not just solving climate change as an existential crisis, but actually saving us an absolute fortune downstream in terms of health and wellbeing costs. So I think we've got to think about this in terms of doing this at scale and pace. I think our speakers tonight are all working in really interesting areas around retrofitting. I think we need to also think about being some way the start of the thin end of a wedge of lobbying, which becomes a social movement where people are actually not embarrassed about asking for more for the homes that they live in. And actually, that's not just about can I afford it or not? Can I put my bit in that I can afford? We need to be far more looking at this as infrastructure. An infrastructure, when you drive around on it, get in a train, etc., etc., kind of gets paid for because it's seen as an investment. Housing is a massive piece of infrastructure that's got many, many economic and social benefits to it. So I think we need to be catalyzing different ways of financing this. Yeah, okay, there's a profit in it for some people. But actually, if you look at the, the long-term cost avoidance that we'd have from doing this, there's got to be a case to look at things like local taxation. You know, how could we find a way of decoupling the person that lives in the house from the person that owns the house from the investment that could be made would actually start to solve it? Because actually quite a lot of, particularly most in need housing, is probably private rented. So actually the person living in it might want it done, but why, where's the incentive for the landlord? And we're going to have to decouple these two things, otherwise I think we're going to miss an opportunity. So I think this whole theme that we've got today and I think the, the term that I think I'd like everybody to leave with is the concept of towards deep retrofit there's many individual component parts but if we think about it as a whole place approach I think we're moving towards something else and that's going to require a lot of different disciplines it's going to require social scientists it's going to require architects it's going to require people actually being empowered to do some of this stuff themselves maybe but also as thinking about the supply chain and one of the things that inspired me to have a conversation with John was I've been a regular visitor here for a long time it really inspires me but interesting a lot of the stuff that you see going on here with exhibitions and people, the products that they want to actually sell, are ideally suited to the retrofit in market. It was the obvious place to come. Um, so I think it's a really, really, you know, really powerful exhibition, very timely and very, very good. And if you haven't seen it yet, really try and get there. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the evening, who is Paul Chamberlain. Director of Design at the Lab for Living, an interdisciplinary research group based on a collaborative community of researchers in design, healthcare and creative policies at Sheffield Hallam University. Paul uses his previous industrial experience as a designer and uses his design practice as a method for research. I give you Paul Chamberlain. Okay, thank you. Um, evening. Um, th thank you for the opportunity to participate in this uh, really interesting event. Um, there's so many different approaches to, to this big challenge, and hopefully I can just bring one perspective to it and show you uh, the approach of, of my team. Um, and thank you for, for giving up a lovely sunny evening to, to come here, and uh, I'm sure it'll be worth it. Um, so yeah, our, our research team um, very much is, is uh, interdisciplinary. As just been said, it takes a lot of skill sets and disciplines to come together. Um, we focus on co-design, collaborative um, uh, activities. We see health in the broadest term, and we challenge the medical model. So we're looking at preventative as well as curative. Um, and in 2019, we got a, a large grant uh, from Research England to look at the 100 Year Life and the Future Home. It was inspired by Grattan's book, The 100 Year Life, um, and it's coming to, towards the end now. We'll be looking quite broadly at what home means, but hopefully I'll, I'll just give you a little kind of insight here tonight. So it's been widely recognised we need to create uh, more affordable, efficient and sustainable homes. 
And with an ageing population placing increasing <coughs> pressures on health services, it's generally agreed we need new models of healthcare. And there's a clear link between quality housing and health. According to the World Health uh, Organization, our environment is the single largest determinant of our health. Yet most research in design of the home focuses on standards and guidelines related to space, energy performance, and the use of sustainable construction materials. So today, there's limited understanding how the physical attributes of the home impacts on our general health and well-being. Over four million homes in England do not meet basic standards, according to the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. And failure to improve housing options, as we just heard, could add hugely to care and NHS costs. And it's forecast that inappropriate housing for the over 55s will cost nearly 20 billion by 2040. So building codes and sustainability rating systems have not fully embraced a measure in how a building contributes to the health, well-being of its inhabitants, its livability. So while there's no doubt we need sustainable homes, it's critical they should be concerned with livability and recognise the importance of health and well-being. So, with advancements in medical science, it's estimated that a quarter of babies born today will live to 100 years old. And this increased life expectancy will bring about many changes for society. And it presents, sorry, sorry I'm uh, This presents not only an economic challenge, but the number of years of this extended life that will be spent in good health is not increasing at a proportional rate. So existing conceptualizations of life uh, education, work, retirement, a three-stage model, will be replaced by a multi-stage model of life. For example, education, work, further education, further training, work, career breaks, um, and then working much later in, into our lives. So how and when we exist with these changing aspects of life and where they take place are increasingly less certain as traditional structures of everyday life and the spaces we inhabit are being challenged. Increasing life expectancy, a global pandemic, and technology pervading every aspect of life is blurring the boundaries between domesticity, work life, and where healthcare is delivered. So while it's important we look ahead and plan for the future, we often fail to look back and learn from the past. The COVID pandemic, prompted an increase in public health awareness and a major change in our hygiene behaviours. They forced us to use our homes and public spaces in very different ways. But over 100 years ago, the Spanish flu pandemic triggered a similar response that influenced modernist architecture and its health-promoting benefits. The modernist movement architects and designers explored how the arrangement of form, space, materials could contribute to the health and well-being of a building's inhabitants but somehow the rationale for their ideas have been lost along the way. Richard Neutra was a leading modernist architect during the 20th century. He not only left a legacy of hundreds of domestic dwellings, but unlike many other architects, he was a prolific writer, which helps us understand his thinking behind his work. Neutra's books highlight how humans have been so self-destructive in the creation of the built environment. Neutra called himself a biorealist, meaning he attended to elemental needs of the mind and the body. So survival, in the title of his most seminal book from the 1950s, is largely focused on the development of buildings and cities that support the physical and mental well-being and healthy development of individuals. The Neutra Institute's uh, are a non-profit organisation set up in 1962, and its mission is to preserve the legacy of Neutra, but also to preserve creative research and design that benefits people and the planet. And in 2022, I was fortunate to be invited as the first international resident scholar at the Neutra Reunion House to undertake my research in the USA. And it provided an opportunity to spend time with Richard Neutra's son, who's 86 years old and now president of the Institute, meet and interview academics, architects, historians, owners of Neutra houses, as well as visit, live and experience Neutra houses firsthand. The Reunion House, as many other Neutra's houses, operates as a flexible dwelling, adaptable to accommodate multi-unit and intergenerational living, multi-entrances and public and private integration of bathroom, 
Spatial and acoustic separation facil facilitates multi-occupancy, multi-doors and exits to enable co-living but retain a level of privacy. At the core of his architectural work was his deliberate attempt to translate an understanding of human affinity with natural systems and process known as biophilia. He recognised the importance of natural light throughout the day that support our circadian rhythms. So in terms of our research centre, our method is generally based on the Design Council's Double Diamond, a process of divergent and convergent thinking. Often, however, uh, I feel there's insufficient attention given to exploring this problem space in the first diamond. And the problem, the decision point at the intersection is sometimes prematurely arrived at and we end up trying to solve the wrong problem. I'll give you an example at the end of this short presentation. So much of my and my team's work is about trying to identify and define the real problem and we've developed creative tools and methods accordingly to address this. Stigmas is a collection of furniture that metaphorically reflects a landscape of old age. The objects don't provide solutions but act as a visual metaphor to prompt thought and critical reflection. They were exhibited here a few years ago. Um, so just a few examples from left to right. Objects that more clearly communicate what they are and what we do with them. Objects and environments that are codependent on one another to operate. Solutions, the, the adjustable chair there with a the hacksaw. Solutions that are often crude afterthoughts instead of integrating them at the design stage. Recognition of spatial shrink as one ages, again both socially and physically. And then humble objects we take for granted that become dangers as we age. So according to Foucault's analysis, the modern hospital is the site of the authoritarian, uh, authoritarianism of, of medical knowledge, the medical gaze. And within this framework, the hospitalized individual becomes a, sh uh, a patient, then an object, through the practice of medicine. So Foucault argues that the hospital was organized as an examining apparatus, enabling almost constant observation of the patient. In this creation, all extraneous uh, variables, such as the home environment, family, friends, and usual activities, were excluded. The hospital provided the ideal laboratory setting where the causes of symptoms could be isolated and the effects of treatment monitored. So if then the home is becoming a place for traditional hospital care, it's contrasted with the notion of a home as a place of sanctuary, familiarity and belonging. So something I think we need to, to kind of consider very, very carefully. Economics and enabling technologies mean there will be an inexorable geographical shift of care from the hospital to our home. The hospital collection, uh, again, presents a metaphorical prompt for us to ponder and explore this space and what might become of this future home. The collection of objects envisions a future of aesthetically and functionally confusing objects, a transient world of alien objects that not only challenge trust, but may prohibit control and access. An interconnected landscape that needs to be tamed and domesticated, and within which access to health data, information, is ubiquitous, incomplete, and maybe confusing. So the current housing crisis is not new. The aftermath of the Second World War led to a demand for new affordable housing for a population that was generally in poor health. In 1961, an extensive government study was undertaken in the UK, led by Parker Morris, in an effort to improve living conditions. The focus was on usability and the lived experience, and as Parker Morris claimed, a creative response to the requirements of the age. The research led to a report that became compulsory standards for all new homes built by councils and new towns in the UK, and influenced those built by others. Parker Morris had expectations that homes should offer more than basic technical requirements, but enable people to express the fullness of their lives. The Parker Morris standards were abolished by Margaret Thatcher's government in 1980 and replaced with standards that have since largely focused on technical space standards. And I suggest we need to reconsider Parker Morris's approach in shaping our future homes in how they relate to people's lives and explore a new creative response to the requirements of our age. So I hope this gives you a small insight 
into our approach. And very briefly now, I want to show how this approach can lead to pragmatic outcomes. The bathroom is generally a room in a home and largely defined by a handful of ceramic products, which over time have seen small iterations in their development. And we thought there may be value in better understanding the activities that actually take place in this space and identify opportunities for how design could better support the undertaking of these activities. And it's interesting how different people have different experiences in the bathroom. It can change from a place of fun when we're small to a place of relaxation as we grow older, to a place of fear and danger when we're old. And it's one of the main reasons people have to move out of their house because they can't toilet and wash themselves. So bathroom rituals are very personal and generally something we, we don't share. And as part of our research, we recruited and trained older community researchers to go out into the community to gather insights from other older people about their bathroom uh, experiences and behaviours. We ran a series of uh, public field labs aimed to widen discussion around what some people see as a taboo topic in a public arena, capturing a broader demographic and ethnic mix of users. And the findings informed a range of products to assist washing and toileting and support the diverse and changing needs across household members through life course, uh, through adaptable solutions. Outcomes included guidelines, government reports, and products informed the findings of the research. And to just uh, briefly, I want to explain if we can go back to the issue of defining the problem and where often there can be very frugal interventions. So in the team, we had a phys physiotherapist. And one of the things we assumed was a problem was people fall in a bathroom and get hip fractures. And as a designer, obvious response is, how can we prevent falls? How can we make you know, hard, slippery surfaces where you're, you're vulnerable, you might not be wearing spectacles, you're naked, it's wet, vision's blurred. What we found out from the physio, it's the sharp radial movement that causes the hip fracture and then people fall, not the fall that causes the hip fracture. So what we, we looked at is the arrangement of toilets and sinks and people getting off the toilet and turning sharply to wash their hands. Now if the, to if the sink is in front of the toilet to avoid that sharp radial movement, problem potentially solved at very low cost, but we were looking at the wrong problem or assuming the problem was something else. So that, that's one example. So just to conclude, the research, very briefly, um, explores the new domestic quotidian, the new everyday normal that challenges existing typologies and the preconceptions we may have about our domestic environment. And we seek to adopt Parker Morris, who said, a creative response to the requirements of our age. And we believe those requirements include age-friendly homes, which are concerned with ageing in place, adaptable homes to support life transitions, intergenerational homes that meet different needs, and homes to support human flourishing, spaces to live, not just to survive. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, very interesting. A um, couple of case studies at the end there that really do get you thinking. Our next speaker this evening is Dr. Ragnar Levesque. He's an architect and urban planner with global experience in the areas of strategic planning, placemaking and integrated development. She leads senior housing innovation at Connected Places Catapult in the UK. He's an innovation accelerator for cities, transport and place leadership. The floor is yours. Tim, such a pleasure to be here um, to speak to everyone and to have this great discussion. Um, what do I see here? Let me see. Okay. Yeah. So, um, thank you. Um, I am presenting work that's been undertaken at Connected Places Catapult um, as part of our housing innovation work stream. And it's quite a large stream, quite a large team working with me on this. So um, why homes? Of course, homes uh, are at the heart of how we operate as a society. Uh, we've discussed how the quality of our homes 
uh, shapes our longevity, how well we live, um, and also how we interact with people. Um, so we are talking about physical health and well-being, but also mental health and well-being as we connect with people and uh, kind of um, overcome issues of social isolation and uh, loneliness. Um, housing accessibility and adequacy are central to physical and, and, and uh, mental health and well-being. Um, and where does retrofit come into the problem? Some of the, some of the, we know the stats, our housing stock is old, uh, EPC ratings are low, um, and a number of people live in low, poor quality housing. Um, also to note that the climate crisis will uh, make things uh, worse as we deal with um, hotter and drier summers and colder and wetter winters, as well as extreme climate events. So how do we deal with this um, as, uh, through retrofit? Um, at Connected Places, Catapult as part of the UK's uh, Innovation Accelerator for Cities, Transport and Place Leadership, we hold a unique position in convening industry, academia, SMEs, as well as um, kind of the private sector in, um, a, a public sector, sorry, in uh, finding ways to take action. And today I'll share three key insights that are arising from our research and also share how we are um, kind of engaging with industry further on this. So insight number one, um, retrofit can mean different things to different people. Um, in our work, uh, with its definitions of retrofit are often focused on energy efficiency and decarbonization, but uh, stakeholders recognize the wider benefits of retrofit, so comfort, security, health, equality, and so on. Uh, particularly in our engagements with LAs, uh, local authorities, the motivation for health-driven retrofit is largely um, due to their commitments around reducing fuel poverty, as well as avoiding repeated hospitalizations due to phys uh, respiratory illnesses or uh, medical um, other medical conditions. Um, however, most retrofit programs are funded by government, and uh, government funding can often tie LAs into quite stringent criteria. So meeting past 2035, or um, a certain EPC rating, or even very specific insulation measures. So how can we work to join those two up? Insight number two, there's a need for retrofit literacy. Now, this is amongst homeowners. Um, two thirds of uh, homes in the UK are private owned and owner occupied. And home, people do not often realize that their homes are, uh, or, or their building fabric is, uh, determines their energy bills and their health. Um, and even for homeowners who do realize this, the maze of technological solutions and uh, unaffordability of those solutions can often present barriers to, um, to enabling retrofit. Um, and here, um, I'd like to flag that able to pay is a bit of a misnomer, in that it's hugely exclusionary of that huge sector of lower to middle income households who on the one hand do not qualify for grants, but on the other hand cannot afford to pay for heating in their homes. Um, in our engagements, we also identify that climate resilience is not a priority for retrofit, except for the very few local authorities, uh, such as in Cornwall and Gloucester, who have tried to do something about this at a community level. Um, so uh, we are looking at a very short horizon and how do we expand our horizons there. Insight number three, and this is no news, but people do not pay for decarbonization in their homes. They don't pay for net zero, they don't pay for urban cooling either. And there's a need to balance these societal benefits with individual benefits, which are very much around comfort, security, health, and property values. Um, and here there's a need to enable resource efficiencies in retrofit and one-stop shop models that are being implemented by many local authorities 
are helping decipher the retrofit market for homeowners. Um, and uh, people might have come across this recent uh, article by Right Move Research that indicates that energy efficiency measures are finally showing up in property values. Yes, that's good news. It's not the solution. We don't want to price people out of homes. So there's still a challenge. Right, so overall, we see that retrofit is required, can address many challenges, but will not happen without any intervention. And also, just to flag up that while we consider retrofit, we also need to consider the quality and the longevity of our homes for our future societies and needs. So how do we get industry-wide engagement to accelerate homes for health and resilience? Um, our futures team did a piece of work looking at trends uh, through various foresight and strate strategy thinking organizations, uh, looking at everything from 3D printing in uh, construction to smart city movements and so on. And um, translating those over, uh, into implied needs from homes and housing for the societies of the future. And future is not a very distant future. We're looking at 2050 here. Um, so um, following this, we um, engaged with uh, stakeholders to understand how these uh, needs from, uh, how these challenges, uh, we defined 10 challenge statements, but how they scored against priorities for housing um, whether people, whether stakeholders thought they were addressable by innovation, whether they were addressable by retrofit, and whether they met individual or societal needs or both, um, as well as how the market was responding to it. So four clear challenge statements stood out and we did more work on that. So just to introduce the challenge statements, resource efficiency, um, relates to not just considering embodied carbon and energy use, but also materials use, including travel. Data connectivity um, is about enabling decisions about homes that cater to building fabric, but also cater to the needs and behaviors of the people who live in them. And also at a macro scale inform where we build, how we build. So. We are talking about local authorities being able to use that data, but also about cybersecurity here. We looked at how our homes of 2050 will meet the challenge of healthy living that uh, Paul's so beautifully uh, outlined, um, enabling homes that are energy efficient and warm, but also air quality and preventing falls and trips. And finally, how our homes will achieve climate, climate resilience. So here we're talking about not only homes that adapt to climate extremes so or extreme events, but also mitigate climate change. Can our homes absorb water during periods of rainfall and enable water security during periods of drought? So on each of these challenges, we worked with stakeholders to identify ways to address the challenge, technological solutions, uh, policy uh, solutions, and also understand how these could be could drive towards an aspirational future along these. Um, and this resulted, I don't expect anyone to read that. <laughs> uh, so this resulted in a series of timelines around resource efficiency, starting from the left, our current um, condition, to the right, our aspirational future, and some provo provocations in between on how industry, built environment, policy, community can get there. Um, so there's, uh, there's one around data, um, healthy living, and climate resilience. Along each of these timelines, there's a role for policy design, innovation, technology. And we invite, uh, we've published this uh, recently in our report on Retrofit 2050, and uh, we recognize we need coordinated action in this space, uh, and we invite stakeholders to engage with these timelines and see how we can work together to um, collaborate on impactful uh, interventions for homes of the future. Um, and lastly, we're at UK Construction Week, so if you're planning to be there um, October, then do come and meet us where we'll be telling you more about this project.
Thank you so much, and great to hear about the innovation that's happening in this space. Um, and as we all know, innovation doesn't happen in just one place. It requires public sector, private sector, and also academia to fit, forget, and no regret is the mantra for me, I think. So our next speakers are Connie Pidsley and Adam dudley Malik, who are both part two architecture students at London School of Architecture when they worked on the Healthy Homes Hub project, commissioned by our Built Environment Trust and currently on display in the Retrofit 2023 show. Another plug, go upstairs and have a look. So, Connie and Adam, the floor is yours. So, yeah, um, as we've just introduced, um, the project we will present to you today is part of the Design Think Tank module at the London School of Architecture. Um, this module involved working in groups of six students, this is us, um, over three months to develop a design and research proposal that tackled critical current issues within the built environment. Um, our group worked with material cultures as mentors and the building centre as clients. Our focus was to explore how collaboration between the building centre and local authorities, such as Hackney, um, can work towards collective environmental sustainability and spatial justice by enacting, enabling local people to have more agency and involvement over their built environment. As this evening events has already highlighted, retrofit is key to achieving this goal, not only from an environmental perspective, but also due to the critical impact poor housing conditions have on our health and well-being. Excess cold, damp and mould can cause many serious health conditions from lung conditions and cardiovascular diseases to issues with mental health and childhood development. As we've already mentioned, the seriousness of the link between our health and our homes is demonstrated by the staggering amount it costs the NHS each year. Um, kind of to dig into that a bit more, excess cold can be attributed to 61% of that cost. And in the ongoing energy crisis, the number of people having to choose between heating their homes and other basic necessities is rapidly increasing. Our built environment does not offer the adequate shelter and safety that we need. However, to reach net zero by 2050, 27 million homes need to be retrofitted over the next 30 years. This is the same as 2,466 a day, or 1.8 homes a minute. There are many barriers to achieving this, including the low levels of knowledge around retrofit. Many Londoners don't know what retrofit is, and only 5% feel they know a lot about it. Going forward, these conversations must engage with the public. Besides awareness, with 65% of households in Hackney renting and 81% living in flats or maisonettes, most people are restricted on the changes they can practically make to their homes. Education about improving housing quality and efficiency needs to be focused on both smaller scale interventions accessible to renters and larger scale improvements accessible to homeowners and landlords. Additionally, there is currently little legislative control in the UK enforcing reasonable living conditions or protecting renters' rights. The knowledge gathered around the environmental and health impacts of our current housing needs to be used to levy for, rent, used to levy for rent reform and improve standards. If the key drivers for retrofit are sustainability and health, then the materials and techniques that we choose to use must also reflect this. The industry's extractive addiction to petrochemical-based products is carbon-intensive and leaves homed, homes riddled with toxic off-gassing chemicals. Natural materials are a healthier alternative, both for the planet and our individual living conditions. It's critical that we think long-term and get things right. The issues caused by our built environment and ways of resolving them need to be urgently demystified and made accessible to a far wider group of people in both the profession and the public. And that brings us on to our proposal, the Healthy Homes Hub. By providing an exemplar space centred around the gathering and sharing of knowledge, the Healthy Homes Hub, Homes Hub aims to combat these issues to collectively create healthier homes. The Hub would be established by our client, the Built Environment Trust, and tests an alternative decentralised model of the building centre that can more effectively share knowledge by being grounded in local community. Long term, the Hub would sit as one of many 
satellite centres, each with its own sustainable speciality. Building on the hubs, on the trust's unique position between the public and the profession, the hubs will facilitate a network of knowledge to empower action on every level. It would reach a wide range of people, from local renters and homeowners to professionals like architects or contractors looking to upskill. This community-centred approach sees every member of society as knowledgeable and active participants um, in determining how we construct our future. We researched existing organisations working towards accessible construction and retrofit in areas such as policy, public awareness and contractor upskilling. The hub aims to join the dots and sit amongst these vital organisations, strengthening collective impact through connection, collaboration and knowledge sharing. The centres will enable the sharing of unbiased, accessible and up-to-date information about improving our existing fabric, in particular through retrofit and use of regenerative and natural materials. A key goal is to increase public knowledge, awareness and literacy on the built environment in order to enable the recognition of the many ways it impacts our lives and therefore increase advocacy for positive change. As part of developing the programme, we imagined the activities that could happen at the Hub to respond to the crises that we're in. These range from home retrofit consultations to renters' uh, right meet, rights meetings to energy bill support and the creation of a collective mould gallery. These varied activities would run and intersect over the week. Tuesday afternoon might see an after-school club workshop for 9 to 11-year-olds, whereas Wednesday evening, evening might be geared more towards professionals with a CPD lecture on natural materials and fire safety regulations. Tuesday and Sunday mornings could offer retrofit advice consultation appointments. Spatially, the core programme includes a consultation space for advice, support and signposting, which will provide individuals empowerment over their home's fabric. A materials and resources display will showcase natural products and raise awareness for low carbon construction within the profession and the wider public. Models will incorporate natural materials into a tactile and interactive educational tool, demystifying what our homes are and should be made of. Workshops range from engaging material explorations for young people to DIY classes for residents and construction courses for contractors. Exhibition spaces allow for changeable displays focusing on issues such as ventilation or responsible forestry. There will also be space for events ranging from forums, professional CPDs and renters' unions monthly meetings. As the hub would initially be implemented as a prototype that occupies meanwhile sites, we've developed and tested the feasibility of three different scales of programme, allowing for flexibility in site type and expansion over time. For example, the smallest site can be rearranged to provide tabletop based workshops for a class of children, whereas a medium site will have des designated workshop space with a larger capacity and scope for more hands on activities. At its larger scale, there will be the ability to host messier and more practical workshops with a construction yard as well as workbenches. To function at variable scales, the hub has been designed as a set of rules and a kit of parts that can be applied to any high street site space. The core components are exemplar of a low carbon ethos, showcasing as many different natural materials as possible in a variety of uses. The hub should be situated in and upgrade existing spaces. The retrofitting of a meanwhile use site is an opportunity to upskill local contractors and bring in the community to observe the process. This way, the spatial design and fit out doubles as interactive and educational resource and spatial precedent. To test this, we have applied the toolkit to three different size sites in Hackney. Each site aligns to our client's key criteria of being an existing space on a high street in an easy to reach location with high foot traffic and access to all. For our smallest scale site, we looked at 333 Kingsland Road, new commercial space at the ground floor of Henley Hale Brown's school and housing development. The proposal seeks to activate and use the existing glazing and showcase the activities happening inside as well as displaying natural materials to passers-by. At smaller scales like this, the activities and programme overlap. There would always be a designated consultation space, shown here in pink, um, and there would, the main space would host exhibits, displays, but could also be used for workshops and events if needed. 
dense straw walls frame and enclose the consultation space. Some walls are finished with lime plaster, whereas others use removable panels to showcase different materials. Shelves at the back display resources such as retrofit wall build-up details, materials catalogue and letters to my landlord template. The medium site is 1 Kingsland High Street, the ground floor of an old bank building with a strong civic presence. The front of the building houses the exhibits, displays and models which will be visible to the street. From the main exhibition space, highlighted in green, a rammed earth tunnel marks the transition zone into the material and resources display a more focused study space with a designated workshop beyond. This view focuses on the main exhibition space with one-to-one -one models that are tactile and interactive, as well as dis display shelves and boards made from timber and hemp. The larger scale site is tested in an industrial warehouse at 51 Mare Street and sees the most significant intervention. A house-shaped aperture that you can see just on the side there in the main facade gives a glimpse through to the main public space capturing attention of passers-by and showcasing one-to-one -one material and construction details. A mass timber structure inside creates a mezzanine and separates the exhibitions and displays from the more focused resources and study spaces, whilst the large workshop in yellow can spill out into the yard beyond. This double height space allows for full-scale models such as a typical post-war concrete flat viewable from the first floor gallery. In the top left corner, insulation is being added to improve the thermal performance of the building. We've examined Hackney Council's Climate Action Implementation Plan and identified areas that the Healthy Homes Hub can support with. Over time, we see the impact of the hub ranging from enabling retrofit of individual private homes and larger scale retrofit of private and social landlord properties to facilitating collaboration between homeowners, tenants and landlords to complete full street retrofits. Public events, exhibitions and workshops would help with the Built Environment Trust and Hackney Council's shared mission to improve understanding of energy efficiency and environmental resilience, including DIY changes that everyone can make. Once the hub exists in its largest form, the workshop space can facilitate construction and green skills training in partnership with Hackney-backed apprenticeship and employment schemes. So, in summary, the Healthy Homes Hub aims to empower and include all by facilitating and strengthening connections between separate parts of the construction industry and between the profession and the public. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very inspiring. Um, it's nice to be studying almost the beginnings of what is a Healthy Homes Hub as well, right here at the Building Centre. So. Absolutely brilliant. Right, our final speaker before our panel discussion is Jonathan Tucky, director of Jonathan Tucky Design, founded the practice in 2000, has gained a reputation for working with existing buildings and structures. They believe reusing existing building stock is the most sustainable solution to the development of both towns and countryside. I give you Jonathan Tucky. Thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, I think I mean I think we're all probably all on the same page here. But what we're uh, what this project was about is trying to avoid what's happening on the right and um, avoid also what's happening on the left. I mean the the idea that we're taking apart communities, um, perfectly established um, healthy communities, and replacing them with uh, and essentially kind of under the banner of regeneration but gentrification removing existing buildings and replacing them with with new ones is both um, economically culturally as a community unsustainable and uh, this whole this this project that we set about is um, is an attempt to offer some um, solutions as to how we can uh, avoid that as as was alluded to at the beginning I've spent uh, the 20 years of my practice really focusing on individual buildings at um, trying to take individual uh, buildings and improve both their um, their aesthetic and uh, economic and their, uh, their sustainable criteria but also to do that but in doing so to enable and uh, facilitate a kind of community um, 
revitalisation. This is um, a derelict building in West London, which um, uh, was a was a pub one point, then was um, taken was derelict for ten years before it became our studio. The lower ground floor on the left, um, we we renovated and it became it's become a studio space. But we don't, don't just use it for our studio; it's also used as a cultural programming and for exhibitions and talks. And so I think this, in a nutshell, was a, is a, was a model that we felt was applicable in both on an individual one-to-one -one scale, and we wanted to find ways to use that on a broader scale. Also, uh, taken that, um, expert, um, I, I think these are distractions, really. They were kind of one-off buildings. This was a, a building in Norway, a, 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 a fishing community that was really um, economically quite downtrodden. The community, there's no, there's no opportunities for the for the young uh, generation to stay there and a group of people bought it and as uh, working with them we've turned it into a kind of cultural centre and art centre and it's really been the, the beginning of a kind of resurgence and re renaissance in that community so that activities both for uh, kind of cultural activities for people who live there and people who want to visit there have really borne a sort of starting point of um, resuscitating both the building and the community around it. Um, and finally, an, another individual building, which, um, again, I guess, suppose inspired our thinking, our expertise on one-offs to try and think about how we can utilise that, that approach to something on the scale of the city or on the scale of um, uh, our communities. So coming on to the project specifically, um, we, we, we felt that um, looking around us, as, as two or three people have already said this evening, we, you know, we're aware that we've got 20% of our housing in the UK is, is, um, is terraced, is substandard, it, uh, is pre-1919, and the image on the left here is also in the exhibition upstairs, shows something we all know, the difference between an uninsulated and an insulated building. So not just were we interested in how we can improve these buildings um, from their climate resilience perspective, but equally, we, in, in, look, in taking the ubiquitous terraced house, we were interested in um, how the streets have evolved in, since those buildings were first built. These um, pictures are in Leeds in 1954. Yeah, the, the street was very much an extension of the house. It was, a, it was a place for the community to occupy, whether it's the kids or the, or the adults in the space. Where it was almost a social space, which um, is much more familiar now uh, as, as those images on the bottom left. It's now a space that's owned by the car. It's by either, either parked or moving. And the idea that people really play or, or act use the street for any form of social activity is kind of feels long since gone so as part of this idea of looking at retrofitting the terraced house we also wanted to consider the implications and impacts of the changes that we might make on the street and on the the spaces around the building um, and a couple of other interesting uh, facts about um, UK terraced housing it's um, it's the oldest in Europe so um, yeah, yeah hence why it's probably performing as badly as it is it's not you can't entirely blame it it's just been there a long time and so um, you compare the age of UK's housing stock to the EU and it's also the smallest in Europe so yeah this is the kind of dilemma that you face with retrofit if the simplest form of retrofitting is making your house smaller effectively in you know, wrapping everything internally um, and the thicker you make it, the smaller you make it, the smaller our housing becomes. And so we've got this, we found this interesting dilemma as well, you know, how can you persuade someone, how can you persuade a local authority or a housing association to spend a lot of money making something smaller when they're not necessarily themselves going to get, as, as someone was saying, get, getting anything from it. So how can we kind of rethink that model um, in a way that is is going to get some kind of critical mass and be appealing to local authorities, to housing associations, and um, and and building owners. Um, our solution was we we this started as a research project with London Metropolitan University students. Um, they kicked, they kicked it off very much in our studio, 
we had we had a great team who worked with us for a few weeks, and it was really inspired by the, um, by them. And they went back and continued their their other projects. It was something that, as a as a collective in the in the studio, we decided we wanted to continue working with. So very much what you're looking at is it started as a research project. It still is a research project, but but came out of university and and has uh, existed in our practice as something that we've now started talking to local authorities and and. Um, housing associations with. But we identified a street, uh, a, no, a network of streets in North Westminster in, a, in an area called the Westminster Community Council. It's, it's a kind of subset of Westminster. It's one of the first, I think it's the first community council in the UK who elected to become a community council where they can, to some degree, take ownership over, uh, over hyper-local decisions outside of the kind of, under the umbrella that, that Westminster normally occupy. And, and interestingly for us, the site that was chosen, it's it's conservation area. So even though most of the housing is in is social ownership or housing association ownership, it's it's a conservation area, which comes with the added restriction of you can't really change what it looks like. So you're dealing with um, does everything need to be done on done on the inside, and you can't change the appearance on the outside. So our solution was let's let's. Let's imagine everyone needs more space. Let's, let's actually take off the roof, the existing building on the left, and then give everyone a new room or pair of rooms on the roof. This, um, this effectively, like that first drawing uh, that was on the screen, is effectively a woolly hat. Most of the heat we lose from our houses comes out of the roof. Everyone talks about loft insulation. Well, why don't we take that further and actually take the roof off and install a new room? That kind of changes the economic model because suddenly everyone's got an extra space which starts to justify what you're about to do to the rest of the building. And so, you know, in, in the case of a housing association or local authority, it starts to feel like, you know, maybe, I, maybe, I can, maybe I can afford to do this in a way because I'm going to be losing space elsewhere. Maybe this extra space is going to free up a whole lot of other problems I've got elsewhere. So you get an extra room on the roof. You wrap the insulation around the exterior, the back areas that are less precious to the conservation area. And so the only bit of the only bit of space you actually lose internally is the front facade where you um, where you install the insulation behind it. What does that? How does that start to manifest itself in the existing street and in the proposed street? Well, it, you know, it, effectively, what's not to lose? Yeah, what's not to like? What, yeah, we've got these two up, two down, precious, quaint little um, um, houses from the 1870s. What couldn't we imagine a more decorative top to that? Kind of almost a, a new story above the cornice. We. This is a building that was um, is made entirely out of cork. Um, there's a whole working with this Web Yates structural engineers who did that beautiful cork stair outside. Um, it's the idea is that the, the material that you move from the existing roof, the, the, what you really want to avoid doing is restructuring the whole house. Immediately you start putting a new roof on, you've got to start putting um, structural members right the way through the building. It becomes a, a knock-on effect. So we wanted something as lightweight as the existing materials that you're removing. So calculated the, slate, the weight of the slates and, and chimneys that were all above there. They then get removed, compensated and replaced by this cork construction on the roof. Um, and the cork construction has a kind of bay window and balconies, which we were beginning to start to think about how can we start to inter create more um, of an interaction between the house and the street. You know, we all kind of almost feel nostalgic about the idea that the windows on a street people might look out of and you can look into. Those days are long since gone. They're boarded up with sort of net curtains or shutters or whatever it might be. So the ground floor is almost no longer permeable and so maybe there can be some activity on the upper levels that has some form of interaction between the, the inhabitants and the street and starts to activate and bring some sense of ownership to the street. Um, an image of the, what that cork space could look like on the, um, yeah, on, yeah, rendered here, I suppose, that kind of bay window with a little balcony. We weren't particularly prescriptive or interested as to how it might be used. I mean, I think we've got to be open as to what people and individ individually might do it. Some of those buildings are already flat, so it becomes an extra room, it might be a bedroom, it might be a home office, but certainly that notion of the, the house being already too small, if everyone gets one extra room, it suddenly just frees up the possibilities for 
Is it someone who come, you know, you rent a room out, or is it that someone who uh, previously needed support and couldn't live at home or couldn't live with you can start living with you? So, I think it's, it embodies that whole idea of wellness. It's just taking stress out of a situation which is already strained. Um, some plans as to how that might um, manifest itself in the building. So you can see those two rooms on the on the on the top floor, um, and then, but in particular, the if, of the people that we uh, that we surveyed and talked to within the um, in the North Westminster um, set of streets that we were this, this proposal was um, located in those those front rooms that were were all being used essentially as no longer did everyone have two living rooms, the front room and the rear room. That was kind of obviously long since gone. So they tended to be used for private uses. M more often than not, they're a bedroom. And so if that bedroom could maybe hypothetically be located the upstairs, yeah, bedroom, ground floor, facing the street, not ideal. But if that could then become this home office or at least a space with slightly more pr um, uh, transparency to the street, it was, it was a way in which... Um, we felt that the street would have um, a bit more interaction and activity, activation on it. Um, then beyond the individual building, uh, looking at how the implications of this could, could start to uh, bleed out to the street. Obviously, we talked about trying to find a way in which the, uh, the car can stop being stored on the street. It obviously, it would be great if cars can move through and pick people up, but the idea that you're just parking um, these metal boxes um, outside the street did feel an, an, an easy win if that can start to become a shared space with, uh, with widened pavements um, um, and allowed ad additional, um, as I say, activity on the street and how that might manifest itself. And really, um, I don't know if that's... Yeah, that's right. No, uh, it just it, it, these streets that you can see top left, it doesn't feel you know, unimaginable that they can have an extra story added to them. I mean, we seem to be these these streets seem to be sort of sacrosanct that they can't change at all at the front, and we can do whatever we want at the back. It just seems to be what what an easy win to get you know, nine million extra bedrooms in the country. You know, it, we talk about the the problems of of space standards. If if we just removed the idea that this, this, this line is sacrosanct and added an extra story, wouldn't that be a, an easy win? And if it starts to justify you being able to pay for the, uh, the upgrade to the building, you know, all, all the better. And a final slide is, is just a proposition, again, as to what these, these individual spaces at the back, small kind of um, small little utopias with everyone doing the same thing within them. Um, could, could it be imagined that within the, the four the four backed upon terraces that actually there's a kind of communal space, a space that is kind of collected, shared, and but belongs to the to the group of, of terraced houses, so that everyone would have a small um, a small private kind of back yard, and then there would be a larger space for the kind of well-being of the community and uh, the well-being for the the diversity of of flora, fauna, and, and people in the community. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Right, it's question time. So uh, I've asked the panel to come and join us up there. Um, uh, there's going to be roving microphones. Um, I'll be sat there as well uh, to be able to field your questions as they come forward. Um, do I need to pickle with Johnny? That one would be out. Okay, so please take a seat, everyone. Testing. Oh, yes, back there. Um, right, okay, everyone. Um, so if you could say uh, who you are and where you come from, that would be really helpful. With your questions, please. Do you have any questions for the panel? Any observations? Anything that's particularly inspired you? Yes, lady at the back there. Uh, thank you. Um, Diane Skidmore, Lambeth, Fuel Poverty Action. <laughs> Is that enough? Yeah. That's a great um, start, yes. <laughs> okay, the first question, I missed the beginning and I apologise, I'm sad about that. But um, the roofs, on the cork, the put an extra layer on the roofing, Jonathan, uh, yep. Turkey, yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, do you still have a roof of some kind? It looked as if there weren't any roofs there, that worries me. <laughs> it, it, that is the roof, so effectively you take off the, the pitch roof, that, that gets taken off, and then this new cork box arrives on top of the building with, with its own roof. 
So that's effectively you put, you put an additional story on the building. But there's no slanting stuff to carry no, the rain. I mean, it's, it's, it's very gently slanting, but it's not as, not as highly pitched as the yeah. 30 degrees of the existing building. Okay, and so you still have guttering and yeah. collect rain and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. could even grow things on that roof? Uh, that because starts to become a problem about weight. So, okay. oh, sorry, I'll be on this microphone. Thanks. That starts to become a problem on weight. So, um, the, the issue of what you really want to try and avoid, or what we were trying to avoid, is dropping steelwork uh, columns and things through the existing building. And so, immediately you start to put grow, things growing on a roof that starts to create an enorm a, a lot more weight than um, we would need. So, oh, right. I'd love to be able to do it, but I think it would, it would start to it would start to look a bit different. But you've got communal gardens, so that compensates. We've got gardens front and back, yeah. Yeah. And one last question. Um, the cars. <laughs> I've done 50 years saying, close the car factory. <laughs> what are you going to do with all the cars? Oh, we've got England, one person. We all have to have our own car, don't we? Why? And what are you well, going to do about the cars? Well, it's a very political subject. You're, you're right. I mean, it's... it's you can imagine it, that was the thing that was talked about most. In our consultation, it was talked about most. It was more than anything else that we were talking about. They, they, it was a very half pe you know, it divides us. Half the people are fully on board with getting rid of them and half don't. So I don't think it's an easy solution. I think, I mean, in, in, in conversations with people where that model has been successful, it's been, uh, they've, they've started you know, road by road, and it, it's when people, communities on neighbouring roads start to weigh up and see the benefit and see what the activity that might be happening on that street, that people may be more open-minded about it, but it's a big deal taking someone's freedom or whatever that mm. is away. So I mean, it's not an, easy, not an easy win. So what did they actually do with their cars, do you know? On the, on on the, the people streets we talked to? that you took them one street at a time? I don't know. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. interesting. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, I mean it's great. I mean, part of the retrofitting piece might be about addressing personal mobility, anyway, mightn't it? Though, so it may be that actually a chargeable electric car that's communal actually takes away the demand for somebody to replace their their own personal one. But uh, yeah, anyway, it's not about. Next question, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Oi, and I'm from the LSE. Um, my question's for Jonathan. Uh, it's your presentation is really great to see, um, and I guess my question is around if you can. Can you expand on any sort of challenges that you faced with sort of retrofitting the interior of the spaces? Because I'm sort of working on a project that is dealing with something similar of like an existing building, but having to bring it up to today's standards. So can you expand a bit more on any challenges you, you faced? And do you have any sort of knowledge to drop on how that would be applied to public spaces as opposed to housing? I think that... The decision that we took was to try and, as quickly as we could, we decided to do as much as we could from the outside. Um, we recognised, obviously, the limiting factor of space, but also people living in those spaces. Immediately, you start to wrap the interior of spaces. It's, um, it's kind of, I guess, socially, it feels like it's quite invasive. So um, we did as much as we could to do every, the maximum from the outside. So the only bit when we did on the inside is that one room. Um, on the ground and one room on the first one wall of it um, I, I mean I think most people will know here as, as much but it there's no one solution to these to these things and it, you actually have to be very careful about doing the wrong thing in the wrong place and getting uh, condensation between different surfaces so the, the solution that we did was a, the reason we looked at pre-1919 houses is because they are all solid wall construction. They tend to be solid wall construction with no cavity voids within them. So it's, a, it's a easier to make a, make a broad generalisation as to what you can do with a breathable insulated layer. Immediately you start to get into later housing, there's, it's, a kind of, it's a bit more of a minefield and you need to be quite particular about what you're starting with in order to know what the solution is. Gentleman at the back. Yeah, uh, yeah a question for Jonathan. Uh, yeah, um, Paul Watt from London School of Economics. Um, yes, yeah, great, great to um, talk. It's just a um, question in relationship to the relationship that you had with the Housing Association. Um, did you target particular streets which had got, for example, high levels of overcrowding? Because it seems that your scheme in producing extra bedrooms could be a fantastic way that social housing, social housing landlords could solve their overcrowding problems, of which there are many. 
And I just wondered to what extent do you think that you know, your project could be rolled out across the social housing sector as a way of alleviating overcrowding? Well, well we're obviously hoping, uh, for, not just for us, but for, uh, to, that, that, this, that everyone starts to think we could do this in our streets under any, you know, with, with anyone as the author of it. Um, the, 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 diff, the, the conversations we are having with housing associations about it is um, the, the difficulty they're facing is often within their portfolio there is one or two on a street that have bought the, had the right to buy within it and so there's a, they are having to make that decision as to whether they just, what do they do? How, how, do, they, how do they do something that is street wide? Do they leave a kind of gap in the tooth, you know, sort of missing tooth in the street or do they just take it on board and take a more holistic attitude and that that's something there that's it seems to be the biggest structural obstacle to them the the idea that they're getting extra space for their investment is the thing that they were immediately have all been very open to they can they can see the economic argument and hopefully the social argument as well but i think it's the the obstacle is this is where there's been people have bought within their portfolio and working out how to um, deal with that. That's great, thank you. And I guess speaking as an urban planner, you know, being backed up by CPO powers might to help to, um, you know, make that conversation a bit easier. Any more questions out on the floor? Yes, sir. Uh, hi there. Uh, my name's Caspian. Um, I'm living in London at the moment, and uh, like a lot of other people at the moment, I'm paying uh, an enormous amount of money every month for a, a flat that's very cold in the winter and very warm in the summer. Um, but negotiating with the landlord's very difficult, of course. We can't even get them to install a smart meter, let alone insulate walls and such. Um, what I'm wondering is sort of how you, how you tackle that economic problem that you mentioned at the start, the decoupling between, uh, between improving, sorry, sorry, the decoupling between improving um, private assets um, and then the benefits actually going to, not, not going to the person who's investing in them. Um, also understanding that if you suddenly change the regulations and standards on what's acceptable to rent out, a lot of landlords are just going to sell up and then the rent actually goes up rather than going down. So how do you sort of tackle that problem? Um, well, I invite the panel. Uh, I've got a solution, but I, I, <laughs> um, so, so uh, in uh, in America they have a thing called property assessed clean energy. So what happens is, as and when the investments made in the actual property that is publicly funded, but the funding is recovered through local taxation because it increases the council tax banding of the property. So it decouples the person living there from the person who owns it, because actually you might just think, I won't bother investing because in five years' time I'm leaving anyway. Well, actually, this way it's recovered over the life of the building, and you can take a 50-year period on that to recover the investment. Clearly, if you live there and you're low income, you don't pay council tax anyway, or it's very much reduced. So over time, if you look at the housing stock as a... Uh, as a whole, the actually re you better recover the costs of the investment through local taxation. Weirdly, and not a lot of people know this, the legislation actually exists to be able to do that already. It's just getting that investment and being able to catalyse it and actually having that means of getting that back into the public purse in the long term would ultimately save us a lot of downstream costs. But any other insights from the I think maybe like our project in particular, we had a lot of discussions around who the Healthy Homes Hub was for, and I think with a lot of retrofit conversation it does um, lead to ooh, <laughs> the um, private home, and we were really keen that this wasn't just about people who were could A, afford to buy a home, but then B, still even afford to do something to that home, and that actually the majority of people, especially in London, are renting and facing some quite um, horrible living conditions. So I think it's not necessarily like a very practical answer, but for us it felt like increasing that awareness of the issues that are caused and that mould and cold is not just unpleasant, but it's like really dangerous. And therefore lobbying and kind of raising this awareness within landlords who don't really care. And I think also specifically with mould, there's a lot of grey areas around whether the tenant or the landlord is responsible and that needs to be like really kind of drilled into and there just needs to be way more literacy and awareness between both the public and their lobbying and also the landlords and actually 
wanting to look after their tenants. So it's not really a solution, but it is yeah, what needs to happen. However, that brings me to my question, which is <laughs> your Healthy Homes Hub, which is fantastic, really good idea, because one of the biggest things is educating the ordinary people. Exactly. Ordinary people need to know what's going on and know that actually, that what you said, not a lot of people know this, if everybody knew that kind of thing and if everybody knew that actually we've got strength, we can, you know, we can make a difference. <laughs> yeah, we? I think that was like one of the big drivers for our group was like there's so many people doing like so, so, so much like fantastic work into the kind of technical aspects and like the science and the health side of that and it's we kind of saw this as like a bridge of like communicating that to the public and like okay how do you we know what this you know what the solutions are and to, okay you know it might be difficult in different circumstances but you know that it's about bringing people along with us you know it's especially with people's homes it's so like personal um you know it's like such an invasive thing to you know retrofit and all these kind of changes and it's you can understand why people are like hesitant about it so yeah we kind of we, yeah i think it's about like the vision of what is a better future what is possible like how can we get there together and like inviting everyone around the table to kind of like work out the steps to go there and yeah. so good stuff happening in Hackney, but how do you get it to happen in Lambeth and Southwark? And, you yeah, know, hopefully the demonstrate. Rest of England, actually. There is hopefully, actually the rest of England. Hopefully, if we can get it working in Hackney, we can get it <coughs> working everywhere else. Yeah. Conversation with the mayor, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> if you've got his number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Thank you. Actually, I work for Hackney Council. I'm new in the I'm new in the environmental energy team and stuff. And we have community grants for people to install measures in their homes. And there is very low take up. So yeah. I was brought in actually to try and increase take up. And I was very conscious that talking about climate change and carbon emissions is not going to be convincing. Yeah. And I think this gave me thanks. Everyone gives me a better language actually to try and, and get people to think about this. Uh, and people can get up to £25,000 worth of measures in their home for free. Mm -hmm. And I think with the private rental, what has been seen in the sector is that where landlords are going, because the scheme is available for landlords as well, they are then increasing the rent by yeah. a lot. Someone said to me 25% mm -hmm. just because yeah, they yeah. changed the boiler. Yeah. And the landlord got the boiler for free. So, you know, the, the, how do you balance that? Yeah. It's happening. It's rent happening control. quite a lot. So I think, <laughs> yeah, but I think I was wondering if is the conversation that this hub is going to exist. Because all the people they're saying, they might be willing to invest their own money. They said, I wouldn't know what to do mm. and how to invest and yeah. what I can trust. And yeah. I was at Kingston University today, and they were talking about that. We need a space like that where people yeah. can come yeah. and, and see it. So, Yeah, I mean, that was the whole what that is the conversation? We, yeah. we kind of spotted was that there was the support coming from Hackney, and yeah. it did exist, but it is quite hidden on the website. and unless you're aware of it, you wouldn't know to even look for it. And could there be this high street place that is right there that maybe you don't even know that you're looking for £25,000 to spend on a new boiler, but then you walk past something in the street that tells you about it that's just right there, that's easy to pop into and ask a question. Um, yeah, we are in conversations. So, like, if anyone has <laughs> any kind of, like, energy or contacts or connections to get involved, then, yeah, get in touch with it. Thank you. I mean, there was this. I think it's really encouraging to see this. I think raising awareness, you know, and, and public information is, is critical. Um, with the bathroom project, there's one quote from one individual who said, "If only I knew then what I knew now, I wouldn't have done it like that." Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of there's a lot of private people who are doing retrofit, but they're and they're investing money, but they they've got they've got no guide on what to do. So I think yeah, raising awareness is really important. Just to add on the grant take up in our engagements with local authorities and our research, we've identified that grants are so specialized often and so on off that it's hard to navigate. And one of the, the authorities that are managing to do this really well are looking at beyond the home in terms of getting desire for retrofit and, and getting a, an impact and demonstrate our scale. So looking at street based schemes. And then there you might have a few private homes, a few um, council owned and you might have some of those rented as well but the, but the driver there for the homeowner 
uh, could be that I don't want my house to look different, you know, going back to Jonathan's presentation, and, uh, and therefore can, can we implement something that's less disruptive at scale and kind of a, a demonstrator. So, but these are early stages, right? Hi there. Yeah, thanks again to all the speakers. Very inspiring and really interesting work going on. I want to look into all of it in more detail. I just had a, a sort of parallel universe kind of question about suburbia. So obviously, you know, um, terraced housing, you know, flats, you know, in, t in terms of the biggest health benefits for sort of retrofit, perhaps people who live in those homes could be, you know, benefiting from all these things um, sort of most significantly. But you know, as well as all the millions of small terrace houses, you've got millions of like 1930 suburban, semi-detached, sometimes terraced houses. C could we also do something for those, perhaps? Um, and maybe the drivers are a bit different. The solutions might be different, or maybe they're the same. Just an open question, really. Yeah, I mean, like when we, that was kind of like one of the, the as Connie mentioned about when we were looking at Hackney, we kind of decided to make it more renter focused. But the kind of way we saw this, you know, like an initiative like uh, the Healthy Homes Hub working is that it is a bit more tailored to the different areas around the country, and it's and it's like it's it would work with people on the ground there already who are doing that work, like local contractors and people that have the awareness of what what is needed. And yeah, so maybe in some places it is where it is, you know, more homeowners. It's the the measures and workshops and programs would be more targeted towards that. So we kind of see this as like like a sort of decentralized thing that can sort of help to like connect and boost like each sort of locale. Yeah, I mean, I I, I definitely think we could. Um, I think it's just as applicable. Um, I think the point I was making earlier about different types of wall constructions are just one small technical, not obstacle, but just uh, we we need to be aware that. Those, ho those houses are often have slightly different wall types. They're completely possible to be retrofitted perfectly, but you just, we couldn't use the same solution straight away. Um, uh, but I think the potential and the possibilities is just as great there. And, um, and I mean, we're, we're just about to start work, so some work with Poplar Harker, who are a housing association. Um, and they've got all of their housing stock is, is of that age. And so I'm um, looking forward to, to looking at that problem. And that older housing stock, some of the people we, we research with, um, they were saying, well, anything's better than what we used to have. It used to be a tin bath you know, in front of the fire. There was no bathrooms. So a lot, a lot of um, houses from that era are converted bedrooms. So they're very, very small facilities that are not. 1930s, you started to get bathrooms as an integral part of the house for the first time. But there's a problem there because older people can't get up the stairs now. So I think legislation knows you've got to have a toilet on the ground floor for that very reason. Yeah. So it, it changes through eras, you know, yeah. different problems. Any more questions out there? No? You sure? No, we are. All right, bang on. Right, okay, okay. So I think what this amounts to me is, uh, is well, firstly to, to thank our speakers um, in the usual way shortly, but I would say this is a call to action. We've heard some really inspiring things. All these inspiring things happening all over the place, how do we bring them together as a social movement to the point where um, people are expecting more out of where they live and expecting more out of the, the, the places in which we all inhabit? And actually, one thing I would say is people's housing and the streets they occupy, their route to town and everything else, that's the commons to everybody. We can actually improve everybody's lives, irrespective of wealth, by taking the deep retrofit of our places seriously. So thank you very much to our speakers. I'm totally inspired. Call to action is, if you've got you know, thoughts, comments, feed them all in to the building centre here. This is the beginnings of another innovation hub. All these minds, all these many hands and everything else. So I wish you all the very best. Have a fantastic evening, whatever you're doing next. And thanks to our speakers. Thank you.